So as I mentioned, our Torah portion uh, this week is Bo, uh, and Bo means uh, to come in or to uh, go in. Is uh, can be either one, and uh, this is uh, the portion in uh, Exodus beginning in chapter 10, and we'll go through most of 13, part of 13. Uh, our Haftorah portion we read last night in the Arev Shabbat study um, is uh, Jeremiah 46, 13 to 28. So half of chapter 46 is what is the portion that's connected with, uh, with this Torah portion that uh, speaks about um, what a judgment on Pharaoh of Egypt, but centuries and centuries later. So, chapter 10, we begin. Um, uh, if you remember last week in, in the last portion, we went through the first seven plagues. Uh, and now we're going to pick up with uh, plague 8, 9, and 10, and again, relate them to what we, we saw happen in the past, 3,500 years ago, also what's due to happen in the future, and we can see these things matching together. So in the eighth plague we see is uh, locusts, and we see that in chapter 10, verse 1, he says, go into Pharaoh, and for I have hardened his heart. And notice this is happening all through all these plagues. Pharaoh really is not, uh, doesn't really have control of the situation. Yahweh does. And, you know, once, uh, you know, Pharaoh set himself up against Yahweh in the very beginning, when Yahweh said, or when, uh, when uh, Moshe said, we're going to, we want to leave, and Pharaoh said, I don't know, Yahweh, what's he to me? And Yahweh said, oh yeah, watch this. And so this is what's happening now, and we learned that last, in the last portion, why these portion, why these plagues were taking place, and again, they were because of Yahweh demonstrating his tremendous power to, not only to Pharaoh, not only to Egypt, but to the entire known world. And we'll, we'll, we'll see later on how uh, reports of this are going to be remembered 40 years from, from when this takes place. And as Israel is about to uh, enter into uh, the land. Um, so this was a big deal, and this was something that everybody knew about. Everybody on earth knew about this. Uh, so this, this uh, eighth plague is locusts. And another part of what the reason Yahweh was doing this was demonstrating the utter powerlessness of the Egyptian deities. You know, the, Egypt had deities for virtually everything that you could imagine, that they imagined that these deities controlled things like, um, you know, the, uh, the sun and the moon and things like this. This plague Locus is mocking the deity uh, Seth, which is a deity of storms and chaos. And this plague of locusts was a judgment on Egypt's economic system. Uh, Egyptians' love of wealth and material goods, the love of money and wealth brings a barren wasteland and emptiness. And we see that's exactly what the locusts did uh, here in this plague. Um, we see in chapter 10, verse uh, 5, And they shall cover the surface of the land so that no one is able to see the land, and they shall eat the rest of what has escaped, which remains from the, the hail, and they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of your servants and the houses of all the Mithraeans, which neither your fathers nor your fathers' fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. So in verse 7 here it says, And Pharaoh's servants said to him, Till when would this one be a snare to us? Let the men go, so that they serve Yahweh their Elohim. And saying to Pharaoh, do you not yet know that Mithraim is destroyed? 
<clears throat> so we see that this plague of locusts, and you know, we all know what locusts do. They, you know, we've had them here in the United States. We haven't had them recently for the last, you know, 50 or 60 years or so. But we've had uh, we've had locusts here in the past, and they are damaging. But let's look in Revelation 9, chapter 3 to 6. We're going to move over to Revelation. And in chapter 9, we see uh, Yahshua revealing to... Uh, the Apostle Yochanan to write down here says here, and out of the smoke, <clears throat> the smoke of this deep pit, out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and authority was given to them as scorpions of the earth to possess authority. So these aren't only locusts, these are like locusts on steroids. They are mega locusts. And it was said to them that they shall not harm the grass of the earth or any green matter or any tree, but only those men who did not have the seal of Elohim on their foreheads. And it was given to them that they should not kill them, but to torture them for five months. And their torture was like the torture of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it, and they shall long to die, but death shall flee from them. And then it goes to give a, a, uh, a description of what these, uh, um, these locusts look like. And, I, you know, some people have, have imagined, you know, this description that uh, they look like attack helicopters, you know, with missiles coming out from them and things like that. Maybe that is, maybe, we don't know. Uh, maybe this is exactly what, uh, what John saw. We don't know. But... Uh, I guarantee you, when we when it happens, we'll we'll know it when we see it, and that's why it's so important that we have Yahweh's seal on our foreheads, so this isn't directed at us. <clears throat> that's the eighth plague. So in the verse twenty-one, now we come to the ninth plague, and the ninth plague was darkness, and. The plague of darkness was mocking uh, and demonstrating the powerlessness of the, uh, the deity Ra, the sun deity, that, uh, the sun G-O-D that uh, they worship. You know, he, they believe that Ra controlled the rising and the setting of the sun, and he was the one responsible for bringing the sun up every day. And uh, this plague of darkness was a judgment against that Egyptian sun deity. And it teaches us that the world lies in spiritual darkness. You know, as we pointed out, you know, the metaphor that's being set up here of, uh, of Egypt being the world of wickedness and sin, Pharaoh, of course, is representative of, of uh, Hasatan, the enemy, uh, keeping us in, in the bondage of sin and the uh, the wickedness of that uh, that dark spiritual spiritually dark environment. Um, so the world lies in spiritual darkness, and Yahweh brought the Israelites out of that darkness into a spiritual light. <clears throat> now remember, this didn't this plague did not happen to Israel. Okay, so they still had lights. Uh, in Goshen, and they they didn't have this darkness that was that was uh, <clears throat> affecting the uh, the Mitzrians or the Egyptians. In uh, chapter ten, verse twenty one to twenty three, we're still in Shemot. Yahweh said to Moshe, "Stretch out your hand toward the heavens, and let there be darkness over the land of Mitzrayim, even a darkness which is felt." So. <clears throat> What we're hearing here is, this is so dark, there's complete absence of any light. I mean, you could just feel that it was so dark. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. 
And Moshe stretched out his hand toward the heavens, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Mitzrayim for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise in his place for three days, while all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. <coughs> So this was, the children of Israel had light in, inside their dwellings, the Egyptians did not. And they just basically sat there waiting for this to go away or just, you know, just stuck in darkness. So let's, let's take a look at darkness a little bit more and, and really what Yahweh is illustrating with this this play. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 42. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my voice today. <clears throat> Isaiah, Yeshayahu chapter 42. We're going to pick this up in... Uh, in verse 16, it says, And I shall lead the blind by a way they have not known. In paths they have not known, I lead them. I make darkness light before them, and crookedness, crooked places straight. These matters I shall do for them, and I shall not forsake them. Those who trust in idols, who say to molded images, You are our mighty ones, shall be turned back and utterly ashamed. Just like what was happening in Egypt. Here, this is chapter 42, Isaiah chapter 42, verses 16, and I just read 17. <clears throat> Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 34. Get a little bit more on this. Ezekiel chapter 34. <clears throat> We're going to pick this up in verse 11. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 11. And we read, For thus says the Master Yahweh, See, myself, I shall search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I shall seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered. In a day of cloud, and thick darkness. So that's exactly what Yahweh was doing with Israel, is bringing them out of that darkness, uh, bringing his sheep out of that darkness. Let's go to Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. And we read there, Woe to you who are longing for the day of Yahweh. <clears throat> So, you know, we have some people, believers, thinking, oh, if we just can't wait till, we, till Yahshua comes back. Well, yeah, that we, that'll be great when that, after that happens. But before that, this day of Yahweh that's, that will precede um, Yahshua's return is going to be tough. And we're going to pick up Amos chapter 5, and we'll pick this up in verse 18 says, Woe to you who are longing for the day of Yahweh. What does the day of Yahweh mean to you? It is darkness and not light, as when a man flees from a lion and a bear shall meet him, or entered into his house and rests his hand on the wall, and a serpent shall bite him. Is not the day of Yahweh darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? I have hated, I have despised your festivals, and I am not pleased with your assemblies. Though you offer me ascending offerings and grain offerings, I do not accept them, nor do I look on your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your song, for I do not hear the song sound of your stringed instruments. Let right ruling roll on like water, and righteousness like a mighty stream. You brought me slaughterings and meal offerings in the wilderness for 40 years, O house of Israel. But you took up Sekut, your sovereign, and Kityam, your idols, and your astral mighty ones, which you made for yourselves. Therefore I shall send you into exile beyond Damascus, says Yahweh Elohim of hosts, his name. So, <clears throat> you know, 
people that are 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 worshiping uh, false mighty ones, basically, Christmas, Easter, things like that, that are uh, engaging in false worship, and are saying, "Oh, won't it be great when JC comes back and I'll be raptured up to heaven?" What Yahweh is saying here through the prophet Amos is, "Be careful what you wish for." Because what you're doing right now, what you're doing here is not going to get you anywhere. That's going to be some very, very difficult times. And it's designed, again, for repentance, to get you to turn around. Same as it was for Egypt, to see people turn around and come out of Egypt along with Israel. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So we contrast Amos, Amos chapter 5 with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is Shaul writing to the assembly at Thessalonica. And he says in chapter 5 in the first letter, here, verses 4 and 5. It says, But you, brothers, contrasting you to who Amos was talking to, people that were worshiping false mighty ones, but he says, But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day, what day? The day of Yahweh, should not overtake you as a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. So then, we should not sleep as others do, but we should watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. So as we see here, contrasting again with what we saw in Amos chapter 5, and uh, Shaul's letter to the Thessalonica, we see people, you know, Yahshua, uh, or Yahweh speaking to uh, people in you know, Amos's time in Israel and Yahuda, telling them, you know, you're you're completely on the wrong track. This is not something that you should be looking forward to because you're uh, you're you're complacent and you're lazy and you're not uh, you're you're not walking in the way. Yahshua on the other or Shaul on the other hand tells us us, you know. Be confident, because we know this is coming. We know that we're in the day. We know that we're in the light. And we're following Yahweh's way of life. So that should give us some encouragement there. All right, continuing on again with, uh, in chapter 10 of Shemot, um, Pharaoh again refuses to let, uh, to let Israel go in uh and then chapter 11, we get into uh, we get into uh, Pharaoh's last warning, and he's threatened with the death of the firstborn. And so um, Yahweh tells them ahead of time, this is what's going to happen. Um, and you know, Pharaoh's heart is still hardened, and he just refuses to to uh, to let them go. Moshe prepares the Israelites then in, in chapter 11, prepares them uh, and uh, tells them to uh, plunder the Egyptians. And so what, what this is really doing is back wages, uh, back pay for those years of slavery that they endured, uh, those, uh, those many years there. Um, and getting paid for it. You know, they're getting their back pay for the generations of slavery. And then he announces what the last plague will be, the death of the firstborn. Chapter 12, then, we get into uh, a little bit more about uh, uh, what's coming up with the death of the firstborn. And, and Moshe then, again, has to, as we've talked before, has to uh, reintroduce some of the things that Israel has forgotten about. Remember, we had to, uh, when, when uh, uh, Moshe first 
was introduced to, uh, to Yahweh, Yahweh had to remind him of his name, had to tell him his name again. And uh, so that had to be reminded of them. Um, we're going to see later on how they're reminded of the Sabbath day. But here we're, we're getting a, a instruction about remembering how the calendar works. And Yahweh is telling them the calendar is beginning here. This is the first month. And as we read back in chapter uh, 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 chapter 8, I believe it was, with the hail, uh, remember the hail, I'm sorry, chapter 9 in the last Torah portion, the hail damaged the flax and the barley. Why? Because they had already sprung up. They had already been in the head. They were already a beeve. They were already, you know, in kernels in a soft form, about to be ripe. The wheat and the and the smelt were not struck, for they were like clots. Those were just those were just like blades of grass just coming up out of the out of the ground. The flax and the barley were farther advanced. So we know what time of year it is. And again, yeah, this is one of the things that gives us an indication of when to start the year. Yahweh tells us when to start the year by we look at the barley. And we also use the moon as well. So, um, so he says, this new moon is the beginning of new moons for you. It is the new moon of the year for you. And then he talks about what, what's going to happen with this death of the firstborn and how Israel is going to prepare itself to, uh, to uh, go through this plague of the firstborn. And so they'll be, be protected. And so the first thing he tells us to do is, uh, is to select a lamb. And that's done on the 10th uh, day of the first month. And tells us to select a lamb. And that lamb has to be examined to make sure it's perfect and flawless without any blemishes. And set it aside until the 14th day of the, the first month. And then he's telling us what's going to happen there. So we're going to slay that, that lamb on the 14th day. And he gives very specific timing of when to do it. So he tells us, you know, we know that days start in the evening with sundown. So he says, uh, the, the, the congregation of Israel shall slay, this is verse 6, shall slay the Passover lamb between the evenings. That means between sunset and darkness. Sunset and darkness. That's between the evenings. It means uh, um, that's what between the evenings is. It isn't in the middle of the day as some uh, Jews will teach that it's between noon and sunset. That's not. It's between, uh, and we can go through a whole study of that, but that the point, uh, and we'll talk about more about this as we get closer to Passover. Um, but he's telling us when to slay this lamb and what else to do with it. So we're going to take that lamb and, uh, and this is really what we're going to really kind of talk about today is um, the house and what he tells us to do with the blood from that lamb is use hyssop. Hyssop, we talked about hyssop in the song we just sang and the psalm we read, Psalm 51. Cleanse me with hyssop, right? We're going to use hyssop, dip it in the blood, and put it on the on the doorposts and the lintel. So the whole door is going to be covered with blood of this lamb. So last year, remember, we talked about how uh, Yahshua was the lamb that was selected on the 10th day and killed on the 14th. We'll go through that a little bit more as we uh, get closer to Passover. But uh, this was to protect Israel from this death angel that was going to go through the land of Israel. And we see that in, in chapter, at the end of chapter 29 and beginning of, of uh, at the end of chapter 12, I'm sorry, and uh, how the, the death angel went and passed over Israel passed over all those who had blood on the door and 
everybody else, including uh, from the firstborn of uh, Pharaoh to the firstborn of the lowest animal, every firstborn in all of Egypt was killed, except those protected by the lamb. <clears throat> so, as as we get again, we're we're going to talk. Uh, we can see these parallels between Elohim's destructive judgment upon Egypt. So a spiritual type of this world that we know is going to happen again. And that upon the Babylon the Great, the world economic, uh, uh, political, and religious system that will exist just prior to Yahshua's return. And I think we can see that all around us now that this world system um, is really beginning to form. Uh, we can see especially with this pandemic that's that's uh, happening, really every single country on earth followed the instructions of, um, you know, the, the world powers. And not one of them said, ah, this is not a big deal. You know, this is really not that big a deal. What? Sweden or Sweden? Yeah, well, Sweden was one country that didn't, but virtually every other country on earth followed this. Um, so, Revelation chapters 15 and 16 and 17 and 18 and 19 uh, prophesy about these end times. And we've gone through a lot of these, uh, these things that will happen in the future that also happened 3,500 years ago in Egypt. And uh, about these end time divine judgments against Babylon the Great, this new world order, this anti-Messiah system. Um, and we're living in the end times. I think this is pretty clear. And Elohim's judgments are coming. The question that we want to really talk about today is, are we spiritually prepared for any of these judgments that might occur in our lifetime? And do we live in faith or in fear? Because, you know, there's a lot of things to be scared about. And a lot of people are, are pretty frightened. Um, a lot of our friends and neighbors and, you know, co-workers and people that we, uh, we uh, come in contact with every day, um, there's people out there that are terrified. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Those two questions again, are we ready for the judgment coming now? Are we spiritually prepared for any of these judgments that might occur in our lifetime? Do we live in faith or fear? So let's go to Shaul's letter to Timothy, to Motius. And we're going to start in chapter 1. And we'll pick this up in verse 6. So Shaul says here, <clears throat> For this reason... I remind you to stir up the gift of Elohim. Uh, we're picking this up in verse 6. First, uh, first, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. Second Timothy, second Timothy, not first Timothy. Second Timothy, chapter 1. He says, for this reason, I remind you to stir up the gift of Elohim, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Okay? What gift is he talking about? It's the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the uh, Ruach HaKadosh. Um, that's what is given to people by laying on of your hands. First, Second Timothy chapter 1, and we're in verse 6. For Elohim has not given us a spirit of cowardice or fear, but a, but a power and of love and of self-control. So do not be ashamed of the witness of our master, nor of me, his prisoner, but suffer hardship with me for the good news according to the power of Elohim, who has saved us and called us with a set-apart calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose 
and favor which was given to us in Messiah Yahshua before times of old. So again, we we want to realize that we have been given Almighty Yahweh's Holy Spirit. We've given Yahweh's power inside of us so that we shouldn't be afraid. We should, in fact, have the faith that uh, Yahshua, uh, Yahweh has given to us. And we can expect some difficult times. He's telling us right here to expect suffer hardship with me. Paul, Shaul, suffered some pretty significant hardship, right? He was taken prisoner. He was uh, actually ended up being uh, executed uh, for his faith, for his uh, for uh, walking on this road way. And, and uh, we we have a difficult time right now, but it's nothing like some of our ancestors did. So let's keep that in mind as we, we get ready, as we uh, uh, have uh, faith and not fear. So are we clothed in the white garments of righteousness, which are the righteous acts of the saints and the righteousness of Yahshua? We see that in Revelation 19.8. We're not going to go there, but um, it talks about you know, being clothed in white linen, which are, and it very clearly describes what is that white linen? It's the righteous acts of the saints. Or do we still have one foot in spiritual Egypt and one in, uh, or in Babylon? So that's a question we really have to ask ourselves, each one of us individually. You know, what's our walk like? Are we still in Egypt? Are we still in Babylon? Are we all the way out? Are we coming out? Are we making excuses for having communion with darkness, the Torahlessness, and, uh, and the unrighteousness? Spiritually speaking, is the sum total of our life wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, and silver, and precious stones? In Yahweh's eyes, <clears throat> the uh, fires of refinement are coming where the constitution of each man's spiritual makeup will be revealed. We can see that. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. I think we we uh, read this a couple of weeks ago in uh, our, our Rev Shabbat. Um, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, and that's where we, we, uh, we, we, we see uh, Shaul talking about how our... Uh, how our, uh, our work, how our life is going to be revealed. What's it made out of? Wood or hay or stubble or gold or silver? Uh, because it's going to be revealed by fire. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to come to this again later. Um, this is also referred to in Obadiah. 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 In verse and chapter, open. I only have one chapter, and that is verse 18. Is what we want to look at is talking also about the fire that is uh, is coming here. So let's go to Obadiah. And we'll just read this one verse. Such a small book, it's hard to find. The page number 617. 617. Six, seven, 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 yeah. Six, page 617. Because it's such a small book, it's only one page. <laughs> and it's easy to miss, so miss it. So, chapter 1, uh, only one chapter there, but verse 18, it talks about. Um, and the house of Yahob shall be a fire. And the house of Yosef a flame, but the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall burn among them, and they shall cons consume them. So no survivor is left of the house of Esau, for Yahweh has spoken. So remember last night we were talking about Esther. 
And we're talking about this line of Amalek. And remember that line of Amalek came from uh, Esau. <clears throat> Esau really kind of represents this whole kind of way of thinking of despising the things of Yahweh. And <clears throat> what we're, we're seeing, hearing, see, uh, seeing here in Obdayah uh, is that uh, there will be a flame or a fire from Israel that will consume all of this. So we talked about the differences in attitude and behavior from Esau and Yaakov. So the question we face right now and in the days to come as these events prophesied begin to happen in the tribulation, what will our conduct be like? What will we be made of? Are we going to be hay and straw that will be burned up? Or are we gold and silver and other precious metals? What are we doing now to prepare for the times ahead? So I'm going to just, this is in my notes, but I just wanted to bring this up here. We go to Revelation in chapter 3 when he talks about the uh, the uh, assembly at uh, Laodicea, Leo, Laodicea, and um, this is who he's describing, you know, a lot of Western civilization right now. Verse 17, he says, because you say, rich I am, and, and I am made rich, and need nothing at all, I do not, and you do not know that you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy gold refined in the fire. So again, that, that same metaphor about gold being refined in the fire. So if something burns up, a house burns up, it burns everything up, what's left? If there's gold in there, the gold's not going to be consumed by the fire, right? It's still going to be there. And that's what he's talking about, the character that we have, uh, that we're building right now. So, um, we were going to read chapter 12. I'm going to just ask you to read chapter 12 on your own rather than read it now um, because we're going to, we've got four more pages to go and I'm not done. So, uh, again, let's go back to uh, a portion of chapter 12. We're going to read this snippet. Uh, verses 21 to 24. <clears throat> and we're going to kind of concentrate on this the rest of the, the time we're talking here. So um, Exodus or Shemot chapter 12. Rather than read the whole chapter, we're just going to read this part here. So let's pick this up in verse 21. Uh, 21. As I was talking about, Moshe was, is, uh, ins was told about how to, uh, uh, by Yahweh, uh, what's going to happen in the first month. How are we going to go approaching this, uh, this uh, death of the firstborn plague, and um, how are we going to, uh, to navigate that with this, what's called Passover. So we're going to pick this up in verse 21. And Moshe called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go out and take lambs for yourself according to your clans and slay the Pesach, the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And you, none of you, shall go out of his, the door of his house until morning. So that was a very, very specific command to stay in the house. Don't go out of the house. Stay in the house. Once you've killed the lamb and put it on the, on the doorpost, don't go out of the house. So how important is it for us to stay in the house until morning? Really, what's that talking about? What is a house that we need to stay in? So this word house, you know, that's used, it's used in a lot of, in, in, without giving a whole lot of uh, scriptural examples, I think everybody understands this. 
Um, the house can be used in the sense of structure, of household, of prosperity, of a dynasty, we get a kingdom. And we have the house of Israel, right? The house of David, the house of Yahuda. And this can include, again, in the context, uh, if the context will permit it, ancestors and descendants and kindred and officers. So a family. Um, so we can also see this in the New Testament here in, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 4. Right, verses uh, 17 and 18. So 1 Peter chapter 4, you know, we've been here before talking about, you know, how Yahweh's people are the ones being judged right now. Not all of the world, just Yahweh's people. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 17 to, uh, to 18. And it says, uh, because it is time for judgment to begin at the house of Elohim. So what's he talking about, the house of Elohim? It's really the whole body of Messiah, the whole structure of the assembly, the whole you know, body of believers around the world. And that firstly from us, what is the end of those who do not obey the good news of Elohim? If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where shall the wicked and the sinner appear? So then, those who suffer accordingly to the desire of Elohim should commit their lives to a trustworthy creator in doing good. So very frequently, then, the house means a household or family or the assembly of Yahweh. And it's beginning to come clear why Yahweh said, don't go out of the house. The instruction to you and to me is to not leave this assembly, this group of people that are, you know, here nurturing and, and helping you and helping, um, helping you with, uh, with your walk. So um, once that blood is on the door, don't leave, don't dare leave until morning. Then you can go out, no matter how frightened you are, become inside, when you hear the woes and the cries and the pressures that are on the outside of it, maybe beating on the house and bringing fear and pain against you who are inside, don't leave. So believe me, brethren, the way things are headed now as they intensify, when we become frightened, we are going to want to leave. There's, you know, that's one of the things that we can, we can kind of see. Sometimes um, the, the trials seem so difficult that you think, well, if I just give up, it'll be okay. I won't, I, you know, I'll be able to work on the Sabbath and earn a living and, and things like that. Um, the fear of what is going on outside is going to creep in inside the door, and we're going to feel the motivation to bolt outside of it. And Yahweh says, don't even think about it. Again, in Peter here, let's go back a couple of chapters here to chapter 2. And we're going to develop this idea a little bit more about this house that Yahweh is building um, that we need to stay inside of. You know, while it's dark, while this, this death and destruction and all this stuff is going on around us, we want to make sure that we stay in this house. Let's go to chapter 2, verses, uh, we'll pick this up in uh, Peter. 1 Peter, we're in 1 Peter and we're in chapter 2, and he says uh, here, beginning in verse 4, drawing near to him a living stone, who's he talking about? Yahshua, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up, a spiritual house, a set-apart priesthood, to offer up spiritual slaughter sacrifices, offerings acceptable to Elohim, through Yahshua Messiah. Because it is contained in the scriptures, see, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, chosen, precious, and he who believes on him shall no means be put to shame. So where does that come from? It comes from the prophets, Yeshayahu, chapter 28, verse 16, where, where uh, Shaul is, uh, or Peter is, is quoting from, Kepha. This preciousness then is for you who believe, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. 
and a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for falling, and who stumble because they are disobedient to the word which they also which, uh, to which they were also appointed. This is talking about people who go like, oh yeah, that you know invisible guy in the sky. Yeah, sure, okay. That's those are the people who are re that's a stone of stumbling and a rock that makes for stumbling or for falling. That's not us. So here the metaphor shifts slightly, but a house is still in the picture. It says, you clearly identifies believers. So he's talking about believers. And you also as living stones. We're identified as living stones being built up into a spiritual house. As living stones, we are joined with other living stones. The believer is part and parcel of a building. So in Hebrew, um, this is kind of pretty, pretty significant. You know, Peter, I believe that this letter was written in Hebrew first. Um, Hebrew was, Peter was a Hebrew speaker and translated into Greek. But, the, and it makes so much more sense when we understand the Hebrew and what, what, uh, what Peter is talking about here. Um, because the words son and daughter and house and stone all come from exactly the same Hebrew word root word. Um, and Peter clarifies this by adding living so that we'll understand that we're dealing with a dynamic organism by not merely a man-made structure. Uh, the point will receive the fullest illustration if we have recourse to the Hebrew in this language. So Beit, which is the word for house, right? Uh, and family is Bet Yod Tab, right? Bet Yod Tab. And Ben is Bet um, Nun, which, which is a son, Ben, a, a son. Bat is daughter, Bet Tab. And Stone, Eben, me, is Aleph, Bet Nun. So you can see all these, these words have the same root. And the root is Bana. The root is he built, or as I believe the common root now, um, is, um, and that word is spelled, uh, you know, uh, bet wav uh, hey, bana. I'm sorry, bet nun hey, bet nun hey. So that's the, the root, uh, bana. And you can see all of these different words stone, son, daughter, house, all of these come from the root word for build or a building. So that's pretty interesting and I think as we we can see this and also if you remember the name that Peter was given by uh, by Yahshua, remember his name is Simon, Shimon, right? And he says I'm also going to call you Kepha. Kepha. What does Kepha mean? Yeah. It means small stone. Remember in, in uh, where Yahshua said, upon this rock, him, Yahshua, I will build my assembly, and the gates of, of uh, Hades will not prevent, prevail against it. But you, Kepha, small stone, are be given the keys to the kingdom of Yahweh. Right? So all of these little uh, word plays here are important for help us understand what Yahweh is talking about. He's building this assembly, and we're these stones that he's using to build it with. So a stone is of very little use while it's just lying out there in the field, right? In fact, we might even say that it might be of no use at all. It might be absolutely useless, but in this metaphor here in 1 Peter 2.5, because it was used by a builder and integrated into what was he was building, then it becomes useful. Family. family, right, exactly. As long as it's part of the building, it's useful. It's no longer part of the building. It's not only useless as it was before, but in this metaphor, because it was wrenched from its source of life or its connection with Yahshua, it dies a lingering death. And so do you understand what this means? It means there's no such thing really as a freelance or independent believer. 
really. You can't just be off on your own and not connected at all because any more than a single person can call himself a family or a community or a dynasty. An assembly is a living organism that's being integrated together by Yahweh. If you leave it and go away, you know, you become useless and you die a lingering death. And this is why, you know, we've been laboring here in, in uh, locally uh, to establish an assembly, a community of believers to work together for Yahweh. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians. We just kind of briefly uh, summarized um, or uh, briefly talked about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So let's go back there a second and really um, kind of take a look at that a little more deeply. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to pick this up in verse 9. So we are fellow workers of Elohim. You are the field of Elohim, the building of Elohim. According to the favor of Elohim, which was given to me as a wise master builder, which I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But each one should look on how he builds on it. For no one is able to lay any other foundation except that which is laid, which is Yahshua Messiah, the chief cornerstone, right? If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work shall be revealed for the day, uh, for the day shall show it up, because it is revealed by fire, revealed by, you know, trials. It's revealed by your character, is revealed by what uh, uh, the, those trials that you go for. And if anyone's work is burned up, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, but as through fire. And do you not know that you are a dwelling place of Elohim, and that the spirit of Elohim dwells in you? <clears throat> if anyone destroys the dwelling place of Elohim, Elohim shall destroy him. For the dwelling place of Elohim is set apart which you are. So we have three takeaways here, really, that we, we really want to kind of get from what we've been talking about. One is that we are co-laborers with Yahweh and Yahshua. We're not only part of the building, the house, but we're also working in it and working on it with Yahweh. Do you see how this picture becomes more and more complex? We're part of the building. We're working on it because... Uh, that is one of the places where a priest operates, is in the building, in the temple, in the dwelling place. And we're working on it. We're building and embellishing the outside of it. And we're also, the second point is, we are being worked on. You, I, we started this out in verse 9. It says, you are the field of Elohim, or Yahweh's tillage. You are Yahweh's farm. The uh, a translation known as the Williams and Knox translation translated that the, you belong to Yahweh as his field to be tilled, is how they translated it. So this amplifies that we're working in it, we are working on it, and we are being worked, we are being worked on as a part of a living organism with Yahweh and Yahshua as our co-workers. And the third point is we are Yahweh's building, the dwelling place where Yahweh resides. The foundation is that blood that went around the door, and once you get in, you don't leave. you got to stay in the house to be protected from death. Our walk begins by passing through that door. Surrounded by the blood, and it always continues without ever losing sight of that singular, most very important fact. Once that foundation is laid, we must then be careful how we build, because though there is only one foundation, the superstructure which we help to build is capable of endless variety. Um, we can also go to John chapter 10. 
Remember John chapter 10, Yahshua is talking about being the door to the sheepfold, right? He's the shepherd. He guards that door. He is the door. That, and the same with the door to the house. He is the door that we have to go through surrounded by his blood. So all we have to do is look at one another to see that. You know, we're kind of a, a group, as you know, Paul pointed out, that we're, uh, cho the, Yahweh chose the base, the weak and the base, right? Uh, that we have built on this one foundation. In fact, we're, we're, we're weak and base, and that's so different, it, it, and so different from one another, it's very hard for us to be unified. Um, but how are we unified? We're being, by being unified with Yahweh, we are unif um, by being unified with Yahweh, when we are unified with Yahweh, we will then be unified with others who are also unified with Yahweh. And so how does that happen? Right? Humility and our willingness to conform to Yahweh's will. That's what does that. You know, we don't look at, you know, how can we convince somebody of our particular point of doctrine or anything. What we want to do is really be focused on what Yahweh's will is. And our other brother, who is also focused on what Yahweh's will is, together, we're unified together, right? Maybe our, our understanding isn't precisely identical, but he's striving to be united with Yahweh. I'm striving to be united with Yahweh. We're both united together. Let's go to Romans chapter 12 as we begin to wrap this up. Uh, Romans chapter 12. Shaul really puts us in a very concise uh, paragraph here to help us understand what we're, we're supposed to do. He says, I call upon you, therefore, brethren, through the compassion of Elohim, to present your bodies a living offering, set apart, well-pleasing to Elohim, your reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? This is the unification part, right? that we prove what is the good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. Not that we, we match somebody else's doctrine, but we understand what Yahweh's will is for us. How do we do that? In the scriptures. He tells us. He speaks to us through his scriptures. So these stones do not fit together right. That, you know, and, the, and the master builder has to get out his chisel and his hammer and chip away at them to make them fit into the building the way he wants them to fit. But all this while never forgetting that we are working in, and work, we are working on, and we are being worked upon. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Just got a couple more passages to, uh, to touch on here before we finish. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And he says here in verse, uh, First Timothy, we'll pick this up in verse 14. He says, I am writing to you, to, I'm writing you this, expecting uh, to come to you shortly, but if I delay, but if I delay, that you might know that you should behave, uh, how you should behave in the house of Elohim. This building, this, I'm in chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 3, four, verse 14 and 15. But if I delay that you might know how you should behave in the house of Elohim, which is the assembly of the living Elohim, a strong support and foundation of truth, or a pillar and foundation. That's what's holding the building up. And beyond all question, the secret of reverence is great. 
who was revealed in the flesh and declared right in the spirit, was seen by messengers and proclaimed among nations, was believed on in the world and was taken up in esteem. They're talking about Yahshua. <clears throat> so again, we're, we're seeing here uh, Shaul helping us understand about this house that we're a part of, that we're inside of. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. Is where we're going to start. 2 verse 19. Um, <clears throat> so then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the set-apart ones and members of the household of Elohim. Again, talking about that word bait, house. We're in the household of Yahweh. Having built upon the foundation of all the emissaries and prophets, Yahshua, and Messiah himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building, being joined together, grows into a set-apart dwelling place in Yahweh, in whom you are also you also are being built together into a dwelling place of Elohim in the Spirit. So he says this whole thing again about how we're being built up together. The structure is not finished yet. Yahweh is still working on it. He's still adding more stones. He's still adding more uh, to this building. But at some point it's going to be finished. And we want to be part of that. We want to be one of those uh, stones inside. We want to be in that, uh, in that dwelling place. We'll finish this up with one more in, in Hebrews chapter 3. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. And then again, this is kind of relating this back to the, uh, the Torah portion and talking about the house that, uh, that Moshe was appointed to. So in chapter 3, verse, we'll pick this up in the first verse, in chapter uh, 3, verse 1. Therefore, set apart brothers, partaking of the heavenly calling closely, consider the emissary and high priest of our confession, Messiah Yahshua, who was trustworthy to him who appointed him, and also, as also Moshe, in all his house. For this one has been deemed worthy of more esteem than Moshe, as much as he who built the house enjoys more respect than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all is Elohim. And Moshe indeed was trustworthy in all his house as a servant, as we are servants, for a witness and all what would be spoken of later, but Messiah as son over his own house, whose house we are, Again, talking about us built, being built together as this house. If we hold fast the boldness and the boasting of the expectation or hope firm to the end. <clears throat> so I hope this has been a blessing to you that we understand this, this concept about staying in the house, staying part of the assembly, being focused on being part of this building that Yahweh is, is doing and being a living sacrifice, uh, being prepared for what's ahead of us. So I hope this has been a blessing to you. We will uh, wrap this uh, teaching.